It's a wonderful thing. We never want to discount what the Lord can do uh, with just one service, just one reading of His Word, uh, just one preaching of the message of the gospel. Uh, God saves souls, doesn't He? I thank the Lord. Someone preached the gospel to me as a young man. If you go ahead and take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter number 5, Matthew chapter number 5. And we're going to continue our series here uh, through the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, this is Jesus' teaching and preaching. It's recorded for us uh, the longest uh, continuous uh, teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, most folks believe uh, this, was, this was taught over and over again by our Lord, uh, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And the reason uh, we're calling it the, uh, the Foundations for Life series is because when Jesus gets to the end of the sermon... Uh, he tells us that if you, if you listen to these things and they're a part of who you are and this is what you're building your life upon, you're going to be like a man who's built his life, built his house upon a rock. And when the storms of life, right, undoubtedly come, not if they come, but when they come, uh, your foundation will stand firm. Uh, about the worst thing I can possibly think of is someone who's building and living their life on, on a sandy foundation. Uh, that's what the, the fool does in, the, in that story at the conclusion of Jesus' sermon. He, he builds his life, and then when the storms come, the Scripture says it, his, his life, his house, it falls, and great was the fall of it. And to me, the, the worst thing is not, um, not being unsuccessful in life. Actually, I think the worst thing is being successful at something that doesn't really matter for eternity. Amen. Uh, being successful at something, when you get before God, Jesus says there'll be folks that day who say, Lord, Lord, and He says, I never knew you. And uh, what, a, what, an awful, what an awful conclusion to a life. That's why we are teaching through this series. And the Lord taught these things to His disciples. And, and God desires for us to learn these things here today. Um, I have two questions for you. And I think uh, these two questions need to be asked really as we, as we study all of the Beatitudes. Is, is, is my faith real? And how healthy is my faith? Uh, how healthy is my faith in the Lord? And all of these things are descriptive. All of these Beatitudes, if you are, are characteristics uh, of someone who really knows the Lord. And such is the case. Our text is going to be verse number 7. So Matthew chapter 5, verse number 7. We're just going to look at that, that one verse today and try to really uh, hash out uh, what it means to be merciful and obtain mercy uh, from God. And, um, but it, we'll read the whole passage all the way to verse 12. So let's go ahead and stand for the reading of the Word of God. Uh, we'll read that seventh verse together, uh, but I'll, I'll read the verses leading up to verse 7, and then I'll read the verses after all the way to verse 12. But let's read that seventh uh, verse together. God's Word says, uh, Seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Join with me now in the seventh verse. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Let's thank the Lord for the reading of His Word. Heavenly Father, we thank You that we can look into Your Word. And Lord, Your Word is, is, is alive. And it pierces down to the dividing asunder of thoughts and the intents of our heart. Uh, Lord, I pray that You would uh, have Your will, Your way in these services today. I pray You'd show us by Your Word, uh, like a mirror, uh, where we're wrong and uh, what we can do to make it right. Uh, Lord, I pray that we get a good glimpse of You today and that we would see You high and holy, reverently lifted up, and that we would worship You as you are, Lord, our great God and Savior. We thank you now for this time already. Lord, we've enjoyed being together. I pray you'd speak to us through your word. It is in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. This passage here, this Bible passage, this uh, gospel of Matthew, the story of the Lord Jesus, and Matthew takes these three chapters and just dedicates them uh, to the, the teaching of Christ Specifically today, this fifth of, of, of the Beatitudes, the, this fifth of the description of a Christian, it's an amazing thing. You see, um, the Lord, as we come to His Word, uh, teaches us 
about who he is, and he teaches us about his people. Matter of fact, um, when we first just take a glance at all of these uh, Beatitudes, we just read them all through, these 12 verses. The first four uh, deal with us, kind of uh, in, in our relationship with the Lord himself and who we are with him. I want you to notice, first of all, and I hope that you notice this all the way through, uh, that the Beatitudes really deal more uh, with who we are uh, than what we do. Uh, they deal with um, the very heart of things, the inward things. If you look back in, in Matthew chapter 3, you'll see that uh, Jesus was speaking uh, to the, the Pharisees and those that had like a form of righteousness from the outside. They, they looked righteous. However, their hearts were not right. And when Jesus speaks here in Matthew chapter 5 to his people, uh, he begins his focus on, on the inside and saying, hey, your heart needs to be right with God first. Now, the outside things are going to come, but we must start with the heart. I pray uh, that as always, parents, that's always where you start with your children. Uh, those of you that have any influence as an employer or, or leadership roles, whether teaching or in your workplace, always begin with the heart issue and ask uh, those questions. That's where God begins. That's where God begins with us today. We get to this fifth one here in verse number seven. Uh, now uh, he's kind of transitioned as to just being right with God in our hearts to being right with others. And you know what? It's the same starting place. Right in your heart is where it begins. If you're ever going to have a right relationship with other people in this world, it's going to have to start with you having your heart right. That's what God gets at. Look, you're not going to be right with me unless your heart is right, right? Not just doing good things or being good. Being a good Baptist or a good Catholic is not going to make you right with me. Well, there's not just doing the right things in your relationship with others uh, is not going to make you right with them either. It is a heart issue. And the Lord Jesus gets right to the heart of the issue as he always does. Could you imagine? We would understand this in a marriage, right? Where a husband and a wife could be doing all the right things. right? And I, I've... Nicole and I have an opportunity to counsel folks. Where I say, I'm doing, I'm doing all the right things. Uh, in the case of the husband, I have a job. I'm providing for my family. I, I do what I need to do. But you know what? Uh, in this case, his heart wasn't in it. And though he was doing the right things, uh, the relationship was never going to be right because his heart was not in it. God gets to a place and he speaks to us here and he describes his people and he's trying to help us for Christ's sake. He's trying to help us. And he says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You see, uh, there is uh, more than just a, a, a shallow understanding here. And I'd like for us this morning to kind of jump in deep. I, I want us to see, first of all, and define for us here. I have just three very simple points this morning. Uh, what is mercy? And there's a lot of comparisons we're going to have to do and try to really hash things out. If we don't understand the words that God uses, then we, we don't understand anything. I want us to leave here today fully knowing what it means to be merciful in the context of what the Lord speaks about it here in this verse. I want us to know how that plays out. How is it that we can show mercy, show the compassion as God would have us to do? And then lastly, we're going to talk about how we obtain mercy from the Lord. There's only one way that it happens. And I praise the Lord. It's a wonderful truth, uh, the gospel of Christ. Uh, let me tell you, uh, many of the problems that you and I have, uh, brother to brother, uh, in our relationships, when the relationship has been broken up, sister to sister, man to wife, father to son, uh, have been broken up through uh, the, uh, the idea where we have a bitterness in our heart and a lack of real mercifulness. And the Lord says that's not, uh, that's not something that should be characteristic of His people. God says that the blessed, the makarios, the happy is someone when uh, they are merciful. Uh, this is the way uh, to live a life that's pleasing to God. Lord Jesus is speaking not of some religiosity or some self-righteousness or just providing the perception that I'm doing right, but he says, no, uh, someone who's really right with me is not is more than just a, a, an outside walk, a, a, a superficial idea of a smile. They're more than just a painted on, good look face. No, uh, they really, in their heart of hearts and the inside where it really matters, they are merciful. External holiness is actually easy. Now, I don't think we need to throw external holiness away. Matter of fact, um, <laughs> cleanliness is next to godliness. And you don't realize that until you're around some really stinky people, all right? But your cleanliness is next to godliness. We, had, um, we picked up um, my sister-in-law and uh, had a little time in the, in the subways of New York City yesterday, uh, picking her up uh, from North Jersey. And let me tell you, cleanliness is next to godliness, all right? When you get in those subways, some of the smells... All right? It's, uh, it's awful. But you know what? 
you can, you can clean yourself up and have a very clean external. I mean, I mean tell you, who, who was more clean, right? The, the person who was homeless, who wasn't able to take a shower, uh, or, or we went down to Wall Street too, uh, the broker who's been lying, cheating, and scamming not only the people he works with, but his family and his home and our government. And, you know, which, which one's more clean? Uh, God speaks to the heart issues and what really matters the most. Can I, can I say this? What, what is God getting at in your life? What is it that he'd like for you to clean up? What, what inside issue? All of you, I, 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 you know what? I didn't smell any of those smells I smelled in the subway today. None. <laughs> you guys smell great. But today's issue is a heart issue. Uh, could we all examine ourselves this morning and, and, and find out uh, if we really have God's mercy, if we really understand uh, what he has said? Take a look with me at Matthew chapter 23. Uh, Jesus says, uh, and kind of hits this issue hard, and uh, those of you that are in my Sunday school class, uh, you know I took you to this passage earlier uh, when we were, we were teaching about some of the founding principles here at Bible Baptist Church. Uh, he says in, in verse 23 of chapter 23, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Look what the weightier matters of the law are. Judgment. Say that, that second one with me. Mercy and faith, these all you'd have done and not left the other undone. So he's saying, look, I'm not saying you don't need to tithe or give. Praise God. We just had a wonderful time of rejoicing for the gift of someone during our offertory, right? Thank God for that. But you know what? What I love about the ex was they were, they were clean-hearted people. You understand? And they did what they did uh, because, because they loved the Lord. Uh, look not just here in verse uh, 23, but look, also look at verse um, 27. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, uh, for you're like whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful on the outward, but within are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. What is the Lord Jesus Christ saying? He said, You're like a, like a tomb. There's something rotten inside. With all of these beatitudes, the Lord has emphasis. What is on the inside? My question for you today, uh, you might uh, be fooling me, all right? You might be fooling other people, but, but God is not fooled. The change uh, that only God can do is a heart change, a soul change, and, and God, when He gives the new birth, something eternal becomes, uh, comes to bear in your life, and, and He changes a heart of no mercy, no compassion, no forgiveness, full of bitterness. He can change your heart and life. You say, man, that's a description of me. God can change your heart and life, and He wants to. He mentions it here. Let's continue looking, primarily uh, dealing not just with ourselves before God, but this relationship with others. Jesus says, I, I want you to be clean. What does it mean? What does it mean to be merciful? What does it mean that God says we're blessed because we're merciful? Does it mean in a worldly way, well, if we're good to everyone else, uh, that then the, everyone else is going to be good to us? Or is that, is that the motive here? Is that what the Lord Jesus is saying? And many people interpret it completely wrong that way. You, know, you, you, know, you need to do good to others so that they do good to you. That's not at all what the Lord Jesus is getting at. He's describing uh, happy and blessed are the merciful, and you're going to obtain mercy. Uh, why? This is the description of who we are. What does it mean? What is mercy really? Well, it helps us sometimes to understand something by contrasting with other things. And so let's do a little compare and contrast this morning. Uh, have you ever heard of the definition of grace as opposed to the definition of mercy? There's a good working definition of grace is that God looked at you and me and he actually extracted our guilt away and gave us something that we did not deserve. Uh, mercy is the motivation for God to do that. Some people describe it this way. It's a nice little acronym. If Paul Eckley was here, right, he would, he, would, he would shout it out in the middle of the service. I know he would, right? Uh, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. Uh, he paid the price, right? And he gives us his riches we do not deserve. He gives a free gift we do not pay for. He takes the guilt, takes the penalty, takes it all, and gives us a gift. That is the grace of God. Mercy is the reason that the Lord did that. You see, he doesn't hold us guilty. It's what causes him, because he is a wonderful and merciful Savior, uh, he says, I'm not going to give this person what they deserve. It's a wonderful working definition for mercy, not getting what you deserve. Here's what you deserve. You deserve punishment. I heard a, a preacher one time give this illustration. This is not me that I'm talking about, all right? It's a friend, a preacher friend of mine. He said that he was speeding, and he had a cop pull him over. Not me, 
okay, is a preacher friend of mine. And he described mercy and grace in this way. He said, look, I was speeding and I deserved a ticket. It was the mercy, okay, it was the mercy of the officer. He did not give me what I deserved. That's mercy, not give me what I deserve. But, but he said, then the police officer gave me some really good advice, really good directions on how to get where I was going. That was a gift. That, that, that was, that, I didn't deserve that either, but he didn't give me what I did deserve, the ticket, and then he gave me something that I didn't deserve. That's grace. And so mercy and grace from a friend of mine who got pulled over by a police officer. First of all, we make this comparison with mercy and grace, but we also have to compare, especially in this context, mercy to compassion. Uh, one of the things that I love to do, and I was talking with our Sunday school class about it this morning, is when we study the words that God gave us. All right, we need, we, need to, we need to study how they're used all throughout the Scripture, comparing Scripture to Scripture and getting these definitions. And uh, one of the studies I did this week, tremendous on the word mercy. And let me encourage you, there's many words that God gives in, the, in, the, in His Word uh, that are translated as mercy. Uh, this one in particular, turn to the book of Jude with me. The book of Jude. Uh, this word for mercy is, uh, is, is translated as, as different English words sometimes. And you'll be very familiar, there's only one chapter in Jude, but you'll be very familiar in the last verses of the book of Jude. Many people quote this verse, verse 21 and 22. 21, 22, and 23 are, are good pastor scripture to memorize. And if you're in the habit of memorizing scripture, I hope that you are, perhaps teaching your children to memorize scripture, this is a great passage to memorize. You know, I'll, I'll start in verse 20. Uh, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, uh, keep yourselves in the love of God, uh, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And some have compassion. That's it's the same word right there. Have compassion making a difference. And others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Uh, this compassion that makes a difference. Uh, this is that word there. It's elion, I believe is how you say it in Greek. It's, a, it's the mercy that God says should be characteristic of His people. Uh, not just a merciful uh, feeling, if you will, uh, but a compassion that leads to action. So, all throughout the New Testament, uh, we see the idea of grace and mercy. And, and sometimes people um, kind of confuse those two things. I hope my little... Police illustration helps you understanding not getting what you don't deserve and then not getting the punishment that you do deserve. However, uh, this context of mercy is, is really God looking down and having compassion when He looks upon us. It, it motivates Him uh, to lift our guilt and to not give us what we deserve. Uh, he pardons our sin. He heals us. He he looks on us, uh, wicked and wretched as we are, and He has mercy on us. You see, um, love is another wonderful comparison as well. Love is a commitment. Uh, I'm going to commit myself to someone unconditionally. That's agape love. Uh, but it is, it is mercy that then takes action and not give the punishment. We need to compare uh, this um, and, and I want to draw your attention to the book of Luke chapter 10 as well, where, where we have another wonderful illustration in Scripture of, of this word mercy put into action. Lord Jesus teaches us, uh, many of you if you're familiar with, if I say Luke chapter 10, uh, many of you should think something. You should think the story that Jesus taught of the good Samaritan. I hope that you think that way and in, in your mind have an understanding of the, of the Scriptures. Luke chapter 10 is the story of the good Samaritan. Remember the story? Jesus tells a story, there, there is a, there's a prejudice, there's a racism, if you will, amongst the Jews and the Samaritans. And, uh, and uh, the Jews is trying to excuse himself uh, by saying, who is my neighbor? And instead of, instead of answering the question right away, as Jesus always did, he answered the question in the best way. Uh, he, he tried to tell a story that they would remember, that they would understand, and hopefully that would bring conviction and, and a little feeling to it. And so he tells the story of a man uh, who gets mugged. And this man is laying by the, by the side of the road, and he's bleeding, and he's dying. And, uh, and, and people go ahead and walk by. And uh, the one priest, I'm supposed he was headed to something, uh, the, 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 the Levite walks by, they don't help him, but then the person who's despised, uh, the Samaritan, the person who, who they, the Jews hated, he, instead of walking by, he stops and he helps 
uh, this man. He, he, he gives him uh, ointment and uh, medicine. Uh, he takes him to a place where he can get rest. And he, doesn't, he doesn't just uh, uh, drag him along. No, he puts him on, on his animal and he, and he gives him a, a carefully a ride to a place where he can have healing. He saves his life. And then Jesus asked this question, Luke chapter 10, verse 36. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell amongst the thieves? So he says, okay, now that I've told you the story, who was a good neighbor? Because he said, who's my neighbor? Look what the answer, what a telling answer, verse 37. He said, what? He that showed mercy on him. Uh, Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. You see, when the Lord Jesus is teaching us about mercy, it's it's more than just a feeling. Do you understand? Uh, He says, uh, who is it uh, that's your neighbor? It's a person you show mercy unto. And and you see the the difference here in mercy of just not withholding judgment and not not giving you the punishment you deserve, but actually having an attitude of compassion uh, for those that are in in a tough place. Uh, those that need help, uh, those that uh, need to be showed the mercy and the grace of God. And the Lord Jesus tells uh, us as well, uh, as the disciples that were listening to the story, as well as the, as the Pharisee here who is asking these questions, he, he tells them what? Go and do thou likewise. I have a recommendation for you. Hopefully now you understand what it means to be merciful and to have compassion. And it goes far beyond than just having a feeling of empathy Compassion is not just a feeling. Compassion is more than a feeling. This idea of mercy and compassion here is an active verb. It is something that is shown. It is something that must be done. When God talks about those that are merciful and the blessing they receive from being merciful and the characteristic of someone that knows Him being a merciful person, these are actions that they take, not just feelings that they feel. So what do you, what do you say to the Lord Jesus? When he says, go and feel compassionate towards people. Wait, wait, that's not what he said? No, he says, go and do thou likewise. This is illustrated, a 19th century preacher, right? He was coming along a uh, highway with his friends. Uh, and uh, at the time, in the 19th century, right, the Model T was just, just getting going. So what did he do? came across an accident with a horse, and uh, someone was, was, was killed in, in the accident. Uh, the horse, excuse me, was killed in the accident, and the crowd of onlookers stood by, and they began to express words of sympathy. Oh, how awful, oh, how awful. Uh, the preacher turned, by, turned uh, to his back pocket, uh, took uh, some money out of his pocket. I never have any cash. Oh, my goodness, I have cash today. All right. Nikki allowed me today. Thank you, honey. And he said, to the loudest sympathizer, I'm sorry as well. I'm $20 sorry. How sorry are you? And what he was saying is more needed to be done than just, oh, I'm so sorry uh, that this happened. Real mercy uh, needed to be shown. Something uh, needed to be given. Uh, That is what mercy is. Not feeling it. Not talking about it. Not just preaching about it. Not just singing about it, not just reading about it, but actually doing it. Mercy demands action. I'm going to put it crudely. Perhaps you've heard this uh, slang Americans say sometimes. Put your uh, money where your mouth is. He saw the man cast down. He saw the hopelessness of the situation. He didn't just, he didn't just know in his mind, you know, I need to help this guy. I need to pick him up and and take him to the end. No, he picked him up and he took him to the end. See, mercy, first of all, uh, is this compassion. I think we understand it this morning. Let's move on to the second point. How is it? How is it? uh, And this is just one example. There are many applications uh, that we can take and say, if I'm going to really live a merciful life, uh, there's many ways that it can be shown. I want to bring up just one of them with you here this morning, and I I think you'll see uh, how they go together. A mercy, and one of the ways we practice mercy, how do we practice, how do we put it in place, is through and as it relates to forgiveness. We see the Lord Jesus Christ. We see His mercy that He's speaking about here is not just a feeling, 
Uh, but it is an action. It is expressed. And I believe uh, that many of us need to express some mercy to others, and we need to do this by way of forgiveness. Let me give you an example, an Old Testament example. I love using illustrations to help us understand things, but no better illustrations than there are of Scripture illustrations. And the example in the Old Testament of, of forgiveness and mercy uh, we see in the life of a man named Joseph. Joseph was probably going to be killed by his brothers. The real reason they didn't kill him is there were some merchants that came by and they said, hey, we want to get rid of him. We can actually make some money off this. And they sold him into slavery uh, to those merchants, taking him to Egypt. We know what happened to Joseph was awful. False accusations, lies, and uh, ultimately false imprisonment. And then even in prison, uh, God is blessing him. He, he gets abandoned in prison as well. Those people that, that uh, he uses his gift that God gave him, right, to, to help people, even in jail. And then they, they, no good deed goes unpunished, right? Even then he gets abandoned and forgotten in prison. When he finally gets to the place where God blesses him and brings him to a place of leadership, he has a, has a vision, he's remembered, right, of the man who can get in touch with God and interpret things. He, he's to the highest office of the land in front of the Pharaoh, and he predicts exactly how things are going to go, right? They were going to have some climate change in Egypt, all right? Imagine that, on a, just on a, on a rotating schedule, seven years of good and then seven years of dearth and famine. And Pharaoh says, you know what? You've been so wise to give me the interpretation of my dream, and I'm going to put you in charge of these things. So Joseph goes from a slave in Egypt to the second in command, the prime minister of the great kingdom of Egypt there, overseeing the storage of, of food. And when the seven years of plenty are over, the seven years of famine hit. And in the seven years of famine, not only uh, does it affect Egypt, it affects all of that region and now it affects his brothers, his family. They're starving. We've seen in the news what, what starving people do down in Venezuela, right? When their private property has been stolen from them through socialism and communism. I can't even believe that our country is contemplating these things. Uh, but when, when, when your means of providing economically for a family are stolen from you uh, through socialism and, and communism, uh, it's an awful, awful thing. So his family, for during the dearth, they're, they're, they're starving, and it leads them for desperate measures. They head into Egypt to buy food, and who is it that is now over them? It's their brother they sold all those years ago. How does Joseph respond? They threw him down into a pit. They were about to kill him. Uh, they had uh, put him through all of these things in his life, and they thought they'd never see him again, you see? But now, Joseph's in charge, and their lives literally are, are in his hands. How would you react to that kind of situation? You know, uh, Americans love stories that end in happy endings. Most of our movies, books, novels, all of them end in happiness, right? Uh, but uh, that's not the case for Europeans. And have you ever read The Count of Monte Cristo? You know that they made it into an American movie, and they made it a happy ending. <laughs> But if you read the book, that's not how it ends. The revenge, the bitterness in the heart of a man uh, who was wronged by someone early in life, when he becomes uh, to a place of richness and power, what happens? What does he do? He fulfills his vengeance. See, apart from God, uh, that's what the natural man does in bitterness. Apart from God, our human heart has no mercy. Matter of fact, if you look at Romans chapter 1, um, and, and the Lord really uses Paul to give a description of any society that falls away from God. One of the descriptions in verse 29 and 30 there is merciless. Merciless are the societies. And Rome was the case. And my fear for America is that we've become a merciless society. No compassion, no mercy. We might have good feelings, but we don't take action. Or the worst of all, the action we do want to take is by the hands of government. Think about this. I'm going to help out a bad situation. What? With force and government intervention. <laughs> oh, dear God. Uh, as Christians, we have the answer for all of the problems. It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Look, uh, the, the scariest words, I think Reagan said, uh, the scariest nine words, I'm here from the government and I'm here to help. Oh, my word. Guns and force, right? And it's not going to help anyone. You know what happens if you don't pay your taxes? Eventually, someone with a gun is going to show up and make you do it, or you're going to go to jail. That's force. That's coercion. God says, I'm going to change your heart. 
I'm going to bring you to a place when you know me that you'll have what? My people are merciful people. Real compassion, real action, uh, not forced on us from the outside, but from the heart. This is a definition of someone who truly knows God. And look what Joseph does. In the middle of this time, he actually, um, uh, Genesis tells us, he had to leave his brothers from standing before them and go into another room and weep. And as they stood before him, he could have done anything. His, their lives were now in his hand. Do you understand? And what does Joseph do? He helps them. He feeds them. He, he not only gives them their food, he gives them all the money back they paid for the food. And he's merciful to his brothers. He didn't act against them in any way. Can I ask you this? Was this right? Was this the way that you would react? This is an indication that Joseph really knew God because he was merciful. You see, Many of us would look at it, and, and this is the, man, this is the, the cry of our age. My right, my right, everyone's talking about my rights. Joseph had the right to mercilessly enact judgment on his brothers. He could have arrested them and had them in jail, right, for selling him into slavery and all the rest of it. He could have mercilessly had, my rights were infringed, right? I was a free man, they sold me into slavery. He could have mercilessly gotten back with revenge. He had the right to do it. But that day, in his weeping and in his compassion, he forfeited his own right and said, I'm going to have mercy on my brothers. So Joseph shows mercy. And you know what Joseph reminds me of? Of the greatest person that ever showed mercy. It is, who is the greatest person that has ever shown mercy? It's our Lord Jesus Christ. And he showed mercy uh, not on his friends, uh, not on his brothers. He showed mercy on his enemies. That's you and I. We have sinned against him. The most merciful being that has ever lived is the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he, he looked on us and he went after the least of us. Those that were deaf and unable to speak and blind and lame. Uh, those that were... Uh, treasonous tax collectors and those that were immoral prostitutes and drunkards and, and weak little children that had nothing to offer him. He went after them and in mercy gave his life to save them. See, the, the greatest story of mercy uh, that has ever been is the story of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he did not have to do it. He did not have the right. You've heard the song sung, perhaps. He could have called 10,000 angels. He said, I'm not going to suffer this injustice. I've done nothing wrong. He could, have, he could have mocked back at the soldiers that mocked him. But in mercy, he took the punishment, he took the shame, he took the beating, and he did so to pay your sin debt and mine. Do you remember the story of Jesus? <sighs> the widow woman had lost her son. She had lost any means of supporting herself with her, with her husband. She was a widow. And now she had lost her son. And she's following the coffin. Any hope of being able to support herself was gone. Jesus stopped. Stopped the procession. Touched the casket. And brought life back into her son and back into that woman's life. Why? Why? Because he had compassion on her. Our Lord Jesus Christ is a compassionate, merciful God. Perhaps a story that many of you think of when you think of the mercy of the Lord Jesus is the story given to us in John chapter 8, right? A woman caught in adultery. Actually, there was a couple, there was two people that are caught in adultery, but the woman is the one who's brought to the Lord Jesus. Shows uh, the feelings of those religious folks at the time. In their own self-righteousness, these religious men looking ready to throw stones at this woman, Jesus says to her mercifully, go and sin no more. And withholds uh, the judgment that uh, would have come by the law, the con condemnation that came. Lord Jesus was full of mercy. About the two most merciless systems I mentioned, the one, the Romans, but also uh, that of the Jewish religious people. It was merciless. They would catch someone doing something wrong. They'd haul them before, think of like the religious police. 
and it was merciless. Can I say this about God's kingdom? Man's kingdom always leads to merciless tyranny. Always. But God's kingdom always leads to those that can be described, as we read in Matthew 5 and verse 7, of being full of mercy, of obtaining mercy, of being merciful and compassionate. Please listen to me, beloved Christian, this morning. If you are here this, today and you know that you are saved, you've, you've gone in repentance to Christ and received the forgiveness that all of us can have by the shed blood of Christ, if, if that is you, then you should be a merciful person. And if you are not a merciful person, and I'm going to say this as compassionately as I can this morning, you need to, you need to ask, am I really saved? God's Word declares... Right? God's Word declares that merciful is a description of someone who knows God. Mercy is not some foolish sentimentality that excuses or ignores sin. No, Jesus didn't do that when He spoke to the woman. He said, I'm going to have mercy on you. You were sinful. Sin no more. And the mercy of God uh, did not come at the expense of His of his judgment or his justice as well. You see, in order for him to provide mercy, he paid the penalty himself. It cost him something to be merciful. Forgiveness is always that, always that case. And, and if we are going to put mercy into action, if we are going to be forgiving like Joseph, like our Lord Jesus Christ, if we are going to be forgiving people, we're going to have to be willing to pay that price. You see, if we're going to put mercy into action, we say, you know, I'd like to be merciful for this person, but somebody... Let's go back to the police officer illustration. Somebody has to pay the price, right? I get a ticket written. I guess the real uh, the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ is not that he didn't write the ticket. It's that he wrote the ticket and he took money out of his wallet and gave me the money to pay for the ticket. Now I said me. I, I let myself out of the back, right? I said me, me, me. It was my friend. <laughs> In the Old Testament, it's the spotless lamb. The one who didn't deserve to pay its own price. The innocent little lamb. Those we have in the congregation that are animal lovers. Look, the Lord was literally trying to pull at your heartstrings here. There's nothing, nothing more innocent than a little lamb. But the price had to be paid for sin. And what He's showing us is just as that little lamb had to die for sin, yes, your sin must be paid for. And the Lord Jesus Christ became that spotless lamb. The compassion, the mercy we would have there. God says, I will provide the justice. I will give of myself. If we are going to be merciful people, and actually put it into action, if we're going to practice forgiveness, uh, then we're going to have to be willing to pay some prices. Can I say this? Men and women in your marriages, all right, uh, you're not going to be able to win every argument. If you're going to be merciful, there's going to be times where you're going to, you know what? I'm going to lose this one for the sake, what? For the sake of just having a, a peaceful home. A lot of times it works, it works the other way around with, with our children. Sometimes it's, you know, I'm going to pay the price of saying no. <laughs> I'm going to pay the price of, of having some discipline, some order. And even though they're not going to be happy with it, right? Sometimes the most selfish thing we can do as parents, and I know this, is when we just give in. No price has to be paid. We're like going to grandparenting before we should, right? It's tough to say no, and, and mercy sometimes, it's, it's being willing to pay that price. So who is it in your life that doesn't deserve to be forgiven? And by the way, mercy is not shown because we deserved it, not for our salvation, we didn't deserve it. But because He, right, had mercy on us. Remember, always when we talk about mercy, that Psalm 85 speaks of Jesus Christ. Mercy and truth are met together. Praise God, mercy and truth are met together in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. His love is on display. His justice is being satisfied. And His mercy is stretching forward. Why? So that you can have forgiveness. When the Lord Jesus Christ was speaking to His apostles about forgiveness, He's trying to point these things out to, uh, to Peter. And if you understand... Um, Peter's approach there, he was trying to be generous. He was trying to say, hey, I know the law calls for me to forgive my, my friend, my brother, seven times. But, I, you know, um, for, excuse me, I think it was three times. Uh, he says, I'm going to do it seven times, right? And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Seventy times seven. 
He says, you need to be a forgiving person. And he goes into a story about a man that was forgiven. And I, I did the numbers again. I had done them a while back, uh, but with inflation, these numbers change. Okay, The, the man owed about $20 million uh, to, to a debtor. Equivalent today is $20 million. And uh, he gets forgiven. But then he goes out, grabs someone by the, uh, by the, by the throat, the Scripture says, over $5,000, all right? $20 million, uh, money that none of us will see over the, over the time, all over a lifetime, unless we have, like, I don't know, Steve Jobs here today, all these young men, maybe, I don't know. Remember to give to ministry, okay? <laughs> but this other person owes him about $5,000. What's the equivalent for most folks? A few months' worth of income. Not money that they'd never make over the uh, decades of their life, but no, money that that could be repaid. Matter of fact, I think most Americans I read owe more than $6,000 in credit card debt. So it's it's somebody's credit card bill. And he has them thrown in a debtor's prison, and the Lord finds out about what had happened, and he says, you know what? Uh, That guy is not acting like someone that's been forgiven. And the, uh, the basis for us to be merciful, all of us is, is you, in humility must understand uh, God has been merciful to us. And when we are unmerciful, we are proving that the love of God really isn't in our hearts. Look, this is, this is, this is dangerous here. Surgery is dangerous. Do you know that? Surgery is very dangerous. There is no minor surgery. Every Sunday when we come to the, to the Word of God and we, and we sit down and meditate on it and we hear uh, someone either teaching or preaching it or, or a Sunday school teacher laying out the lesson, you know what we're doing? We're undergoing spiritual surgery. So the Word of God is sharp, right? It's quick, it's alive, it's powerful, and it gets right down to things. Man, the scalpel of the Holy Spirit goes right to our heart, doesn't it? And it destroys us many times. It breaks us down like an anvil Cleans us up. Let's go through. The, the, are we poor? Are we broken? Do we mourn for our sins? Are we meek in front of all men, in front of ourselves? Are we empty that God will fill us? Do we realize, and this is our lesson today, that God has shown mercy upon us? Therefore, when we see some pitiful right, situation of another human being, someone we have relationships in, will be willing to apply mercy and say, I'm going to be forgiving. But you don't know what they did to me. You don't know what was said to me. You don't know how I felt to that situation. I've been wronged. Yes. I'm not arguing against any of those things. But I'm saying we should still be merciful people because that's the description of someone who has been saved by God and we have had His mercy upon us. If we do not have the desire or ability within ourselves to have compassion on a dying world, what the Lord is saying, maybe we don't really know Him because you know what? The Lord Jesus Christ had compassion on a dying world. And He did something about it. To forgive one another as Christ has forgiven us. Jesus says uh, that even the life of God may not uh, dwell in your hearts. Why? Because when the love of God is in our hearts, it's shed abroad. So, remember what I started out the sermon with? How is your faith, right? Is it real and is it healthy? So this morning, how is your, specifically today, how is your mercy? Is it real? Is it healthy? When's the last time you took some time and maybe we just need to do that just for a second. Think about the mercy that God had on you. God knew all the sin that you'd commit, the lies you'd tell, the evil thoughts, evil deeds, the manipulation, I, I mean, uh, the violence even. He knew all of it. And he had mercy on you. And then you're going to say, but I'm not going to live a life of mercy. I'm not going to be a merciful person. I'm not going, I'm not going to let uh, my life be categorized as, as, as having mercy. Look, forgiveness is a, it's a very, very powerful thing. And it takes us applying mercy. Many of us, we apply mercy, Right? You heard it described this way, bury the hatchet. Bury the hatchet in the back of someone else. That's not the same thing. I saw a company a billboard one time, to err his human, to forgive is not company policy. Have you noticed that it is much 
easier to forgive someone after you've gotten even with them? <laughs> that is not mercy. Mercy is I'm not going to get even. I'm going to offer forgiveness. I'm going to take right whatever price there is to be paid upon myself, and I'm going to be merciful. Why? Because God was merciful to me. Look, our world does not emphasize mercy or mercifulness. It's my right. This is my right to do it. I have a right right here. Well, if you were living in the Roman Empire during Jesus' day, I mean, they had all the right to kill him. Blasphemy, right? The Jews had all the right. Do you know this? This is in my studies. Maybe some of you need to study it out as well. Uh, every society that gets to a, a certain level of corruption always targets the young and the elderly. Always. In Rome, it was the right of a father as a Roman citizen, to, after the birth of their child, take a look at the child, put his thumb up or thumbs down, and either let the child live or have it slaughtered and killed right there. Find ourselves in the same place today, don't we? Parents, thumbs up, thumbs down, do whatever you want. That's, can I say this? Merciless. It's merciless. And it should never be the characteristic of someone who knows God. We should be people of mercy. Look, the reality is this. What Jesus Christ is, is saying to us and what He wants us to grasp today as Christians is that we need to show mercy towards others. How does it happen? I'm going I'm to throw this one out there. Everyone says, pastors always talk about finances. How about forgiving someone financially? Nicole and I actually had to do that early on in our marriage. We had a little con man situation. You remember Manny? <laughs> what, what, what do you do then? Say, okay, with, with relationships, with all these things, what, what about if it costs you something? How about that one financially? Wow. We should be merciful people. Physically, emotionally, financially. And if you cannot do that, look, in your flesh, and in your strength of your flesh, you cannot do that. But you know what you can do in the strength of God? You can be and have the power to be a merciful person. If you say, Pastor, I just can't do it, then perhaps you need to be at the altar today, kneel down in your seat there, and grab someone by the hand and say, I, we need to pray. I need God's help. I can't be as merciful as I need to be. That's great. But you know what? Through the Spirit of God and the strength that He gives, by God's grace, you can be. God can do His work in all of our hearts today. You can have walked in here unmerciful and leave merciful. Why? Because God, by His grace, gives us the fruit of His Spirit. These are the things that the Lord does when He works on us. You know what? I, I would hate, I'd hate for folks to walk in one way and leave the same way. That, God doesn't desire any Christians to come to a church service and leave exactly the way they came. He wants us to be changed by the power of His Word and have His Spirit work in our hearts. If you're here today and you, you don't know the Lord as your Savior, you have no hope of being merciful. The longer you live, the harder your heart will grow. But God in His mercy has extended salvation to you. Today can be the day of your salvation. Though you don't deserve it and none of us that are saved did deserve it, God can save you. It's the beauty of the gospel. He took the price on His own head and paid for your sin. Look, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God testifies this. That He is a merciful God and He, with the new birth, enables us to be merciful people. It is not the way to be saved. Can I say that? How do we obtain mercy? How, how do we get the forgiveness of God? By, by acting real good and being merciful. Then we'll be saved. No, 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 no. You put the cart before the horse. If we truly have received the mercy of God, how to receive that? Simple repentance and faith. That's it. God, will you have mercy on me? You remember the story of the two that went? Jesus said one of them, two of them went to the temple. One of them left justified. The other one did not. Which one left? The one that pounded on his chest and couldn't even look up in prayer and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. How is it that we receive the mercy of God? How do we obtain mercy from God? It's not by being merciful to others. It's by claiming the mercy of God, saying, God, would you create in me a, a merciful person? I cannot do it on myself, but if you'll be merciful to me, you have the power to create in me a, a merciful person. That's our request. That's our, our prayer to God. That is the way of salvation. God, have mercy on me. 
Or we can go about just like the, the lawyer, the Pharisee that day. Um, who's my neighbor? Who am I going to show mercy towards? Uh, uh, someone who's going to... No. That's the conniving way of the world. Let's let God make His people, His Christians here, let's let Him make us different. Unforgiveness, unmercifulness is not a fruit of the Spirit. What is it a fruit of? It's a fruit of our flesh. God desires for you and me to be merciful. And that's how we, that's how we prove that we have obtained mercy from God. Let's pray together. Would you pray with me about this today? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the mercy that you've had on our souls. Thank you that you are a merciful God. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us today to see the, the, uh, the road to obedience is submission or to desire more than just a good feeling, but an understanding of the sacrifice you made to save us. Dear God, we're willing. I pray you'd give us your strength, your power. Lord, help us with our unwillingness. I pray that we would trust in you more. I pray you'd convict us. How much mercy have we had? Those that have wronged us, wicked, the poor. I pray we'd have compassion. Dear God, we extend that compassion with real forgiveness to our brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, but to, to anyone. I pray that this would be a shining example of your mercy and that we would have opportunity to, to share the gospel, to share your forgiveness to others because we have applied the mercifulness that you've given and we have been forgiving people. We ask you to help us. We need thy help. Before we close this.